welcome to the Natasha Helper Podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelper.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional Facebook page at Natasha Helper LCMFT CST S. You can find all her core cool resources at natashahelper.com. This podcast addresses many topics around mental health and sexuality and may not be suitable for minors. Some topics may elicit a trigger or emotional response, so care for yourself accordingly. The intro and outro music for these episodes is by Autocrate. Hello, everybody. This is Natasha Helfer. This is the Natasha Helfer podcast where we try to attack shame from all different kinds of perspectives, whether it's professionals or people's, you know, uh, personal stories or education or research, anything we can we can throw at shame. Boy, are we interested in that? <laughs> so I am super excited to have my guest today, Dr. Jolie Hamilton. She's a relationship coach and expert who loves to say that she colors outside the lines. And I kind of love that about you. She's a research psychologist. She's given a TED talk on compersion, which we'll definitely be covering today. She's a best-selling author. She's a sex certified sex educator. She has a lot of things. She also co-hosts uh, the Playing With Fire podcast with her anchor partner, Ken. So just a lot of really great things that she's offering the world. And I'm super excited to talk to her today. She's definitely spent two decades studying and reimagining kind of how we think about love and relationships. And so one of her areas of expertise is helping people create non-monogamous partnerships. So welcome to the show, Julie. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thanks for having me, Natasha. It's always, I mean, you're right. Let's throw everything we can at shame. Let's go for it. (laughs) Well, and as I was listening to your TED talk, one of the things that immediately caught my, cause I'm kind of like a shame junkie, not the, not the, you know, the wrong you don't way. Want it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I want it. I don't want it. Um, but, but your aunt and I are up for it all the time. Yes. Right? And you yeah. said jealousy can be, we can feel shame about our jealousy, right? So anyway, so I'm definitely going to want to talk about that. So why don't we start with whatever you feel I missed about introducing you? Like, tell us mm. a little bit about yourself personally and what you'd like to share with our audience and kind of help us get to know you. Sure. So I am the founder of the Year of Opening. So yeah, I do. I help people figure out how to do non-monogamy in a way that works for them. But I think in my personal life, the thing that people usually are most caught off guard by is that I have seven kids, which isn't that unusual. Lots of us do have big families, but I think we tend to forget that um, people with big families are still kind of everywhere. I look like a soccer mom, but yes, I have a very non-traditional marriage and I like that. I like that weird juxtaposition. Yeah, I love that. And I love that. I mean, obviously, you're open about being in an open marriage, which is not something necessarily that a lot of people are comfortable sharing with their children or publicly. So maybe we can just kind of touch base on that. Like, tell us about how you started your journey and why this is important to you and kind of some of the, I don't know, social hurdles, right? Like there can be a lot of discrimination and myths and judgments for people who are in open marriage. And one of the reasons why we are concerned, I think that a lot of people don't even opt in sharing that they're in non-monogamous relationships, right? Right. Yeah. I heard just this morning, somebody say that a recent poll showed 40% of individuals are now describing their marriages as less than monogamous, but that doesn't mean that we're comfortable actually saying I'm non-monogamous or I'm polyamorous or I'm consensually non-monogamous or whatever label you choose because yeah, there's stigma. And in some cases there's outright discrimination. And I feel very lucky in that um, I, because when I shifted from a monogamous paradigm to a non-monogamous paradigm, I accidentally and naively just told everyone thinking nothing of it. Um, That was 15 years ago. I didn't know what I was getting into. It didn't land well with most people. And in fact, I lost quite a lot. So Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that people just go fly in all of their information to everyone. However, feel really lucky. 
I feel really, really lucky that I outed myself because what I've learned over time is that that has allowed me to be authentic and to create not just my romantic partnerships, but my friendships, my community circles, my colleagues, like these people know all of me. And I am absolutely blessed to not have to hide myself from them. Even the people who don't necessarily, like they don't get it. They don't necessarily understand why I would do this. The people who opt to stay in are people who can just say, well, yeah, but that's that's your life and that's okay and great. Like, let's coexist. And so that's been huge for me to just face it. And on top of that, um, now it's been 15 years. There's a lot more people talking about this now. Yeah. We're really lucky that yeah. it's changing. Well, and I think like anything, it's people like you who are willing to be more open over the years that make it more possible to have these conversations in more public ways. So not that I expect you to know much about me, but I work with a lot of conservative religious folks. That's been primarily the space that I've kind of been in both uh, geographically and also just my own personal history. So as we're seeing a lot of people leave organized religion, that seems to be a trend that we're seeing, or stay very spiritual or even religious, but maybe in less orthodox ways, more ways that are based on self-authority instead of external authority of some pastor or priest or whatever it may be. I have seen an uptick in interest in non-monogamy, right? And And I think we're kind of seeing this in general, even outside of religious circles, like the monogamous structure, where, you know, 40% of first marriages have trended towards divorce and second and third marriages have trended towards, you know, like 70% to 80% divorce. So like monogamy doesn't have the best maybe track record. And, and that's also, you know, not even including all the infidelity that we find in monogamy. And so I think a lot of folks are just kind of like, you know, I saw my parents try to do it. I don't want to end up in that marriage where I'm just kind of enduring to the end. I don't want to be, you know, kind of in a roommate situation where all passion has left or we're in a sexless marriage or all the many reasons or challenges. I think that prior generations dealt with long-term relationships, but without a lot of skills or know how even, even on how to have good monogamy. (laughs) So, um, so I, I just see a lot more interest. I mean, is that something that you're finding as well in your circles? Definitely. And, you know, I have more and more people who are working with me um, would describe themselves as either being immersed in a conservative culture right now or having grown up in one and trying to find their where they fit now. And I think that that makes sense because who you love is not actually like that should not be the defining feature of your spirituality. Your spirituality is yours. And I think it's really interesting to see how many people are shifting into what I think of as consensual negotiated relationships, even if that is monogamy, but they're consensual as in they are overtly, explicitly talking about what they're doing. That's on a huge rise. And I think that is for a lot of different reasons. But if that can help us avoid the trap of, yeah, bearing with and just enduring as if longevity is the sole measure that we should ever put a relationship to. Um, Personally, longevity just doesn't work for me. And when people were asking me when I was doing my doctoral research on non-monogamy, a lot of my um, core professors were like, well, you know, non-monogamy, yeah, like, sure, but it doesn't work. Like, Mm. wait, Mm. you're, you're probably now defining what works as longevity. But like the statistics you just cited, neither does monogamy then. (laughs) and and so maybe we don't maybe that's just not the best metric maybe instead we need to think about what is what are the metrics so for me i have my own personal metrics what makes a relationship really good for me and i think each of us individually should understand that and be able to communicate about that with our partners because from there we can start to build things that actually work for us and if that means that we transition out of relationships well, cool. Maybe we could do that in a way that doesn't blast our families into pieces. Maybe we can do that in a way that my own first marriage ended in this really brutal, like falling apart because we didn't know how to talk. We didn't know how to be married well with great communication. So then when we split, it only got worse. Mm -hmm. I really do think that this is about prioritizing what we actually see as successful relationship as far more than just longevity. 
I, I love that because yeah, just in the language that we're all kind of swimming in, it's like, oh, it's a failed marriage, you know, or yeah, the idea that because you haven't stayed together for 60 plus years, you're failing instead right. of maybe what's the quality of the relationship we're in, how, what are the needs of the individual people? How have we shifted in our own adult development after being with somebody for one to two to three decades? <laughs> A lot of things are shifting that are not really getting addressed in the monogamy model. And, and that's why I, I find too, that you've, like you've, you've already mentioned this, even the principles of non-monogamy can still apply to monogamy because it's not so much about which lifestyle or which relationship structure you choose. It's more about the principles and the ideas behind what you're choosing, right? That's a hundred percent true. And this is where I, so I think of myself primarily as a comprehensive relationship educator. My goal is to give people a comprehensive set of relationship principles, tools, methods, ways of being in relationship that will work in all of their relationships, including their friendships, including their relationships, their their parents, their children, because we we aren't taught how to relate. Most of us don't get taught that specifically. And then we're not ta- we're not given very great models because nobody was taught that. And so now if we really think about comprehensive relationship education, well, that obviously is necessary. If I'm going to have multiple partners and I'm going to juggle the time implications of that, the heart implications of that, the sexual implications of that, it makes sense. People are usually like, yeah, I guess I'll need to know some stuff. <laughs> but every skill I learn over there, I can apply to monogamy. The yeah. same can't be said about every skill you learn for monogamy. If you go to seek out help for your monogamous connection, you might learn some great skills that were great in that container. But if you try to transfer them to a more complex situation, a lot of times those same exact principles just fall flat. They don't work. Some of them work great, but a lot of them don't. The idea yeah. that, for instance, closing out the third, well, obviously, that doesn't work. <laughs> that mm-hmm. that would be antithetical to the principle of developing consensual non-monogamous relationships. Right. But it's core to the principle of many monogamous centric therapeutic methods. Right. Right. Can you, I know what you mean by that. I'm not sure everybody else knows what you mean by yeah. closing out the third. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, let's make it really simple. Let's not put it in any, wrap it in any jargon and just say, if I, I, I'm a depth psychologist. I trained in Jungian and archetypal psychology. So when I think about someone, someone I'm interested in, if I think about another human I actually know, or I think about a uh, celebrity I have a crush on, or anything, any any other, capital O, other, right, who comes into my imagination as someone who I might be interested in, in a romantic or sexual or sensual way, Typically, in a monogamous container, we would say, oh, that's a third. We need to we need to knock that off. We don't want any of that because that is problematic because at all costs, we're trying to protect the dyad, that we're trying to protect the couplehood. But that doesn't actually, that, that rule doesn't make any sense at all when we're trying to have a more complex imagination of relating. And it also doesn't make a lot of sense to monogamous people who are trying to really thoroughly embrace the fact that their partner is an individual and is separate from them and differentiated, and they want them to have a rich and fulfilling life of friends and fantasies and whatever else they've got within whatever the bounds are of their relationship agreements. So the third can be a really healthy thing that we bring into even our monogamy from my perspective, because it can encourage us to be differentiated and hold the fullness of our partner's authentic authentic fantasies and, and attractions and interests, and to learn to trust them to honor the boundaries that we've set and created together, wherever those might be. I couldn't agree with you more. I, I don't think closing out the third is even healthy in monogamy because then you get into kind of this ownership model of, you know, I, you belong to me and I belong to you and we're only allowed to think about each other. And it's just not very realistic as human beings. <laughs> we know this doesn't really work. And yet, like you're saying, many therapists, many relational people are, you know, kind of embracing these kinds of ideas for couples who are coming to them for help which just, again, speaks to our field not being very non-monogamous affirming. And so when you say, you know, you kind of came across these professors who says, well, it just doesn't work. That's something I hear all the time, but it doesn't work, or that's the main, you know, fear. 
Can you talk about some of the myths that we need to kind of deconstruct because it, it can work. It does work. Like you said, monogamy doesn't always work. So how do we, how do we talk about work? How, how does it work? What does work mean? How do, Sorry, what does it working mean? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so here's the thing. I can't tell you, and and you can't tell me, but every single person listening can define for themselves what it means for a relationship to work. And I would hope that they would plan. I hope every single person listening plans to take some time and actually reflect on that. Even five minutes of reflection on what does it mean? What would it look like? What would it sound like? What would it feel like for a relationship to work for me? And you might need to be contextual about that. Like, what would it look like in my home? What would it look like when we're at a restaurant? What would it feel like when we're in bed? Define for yourself what that would look like. And then ideally revisit that because you're going to grow and change and allow that to change and grow with you because that that's huge. That will change how it feels to be even inside a monogamous container because you may have many marriages with, to the same person if you're allowed to grow and change. But if your picture of what a, a working marriage is or a working partnership is has to be the same forever, you're probably going to hit some really significant speed bumps. They might feel more like solid walls that you just run straight into. And ideally, we'd also have these conversations with our partner. So I ask people all the time to do an exercise called the, um, what's our relationship purpose? What's mm -hmm. it for? What is my relationship for? Because if if I'm single and I get clear on ah, a relationship that works, for me, a relationship that works would look like, oh, I would have pretty continual contact. You know, I would know if they were going to go no contact for more than 48 hours. And oh yeah, we'd have, we'd have sex and we'd have, we'd have some overlapping interests, but not all overlapping interests, right? I start going through and just making a list for myself. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, what if I'm in a partnership? Do I allow my partner to actually define what a working relationship is for them. And then we find the Venn diagram. Where's the Vesica Pisces, the center of that Venn diagram that is where we overlap? And is it sufficient? Is there enough overlap for us to agree? Or have we been just relying on, this is just what marriage is. This is just what partnership is. You don't get to define that. You have to do this because my parents did. You have to do that because everybody does. I promise you, everybody doesn't. Yeah, I'm or, or even like the kids need us too. Yeah, right. That's yeah. an oftentimes a very difficult space is to feel like, oh, in order to give our kids the best chance, we have to be like monogamously partnered. Um, and very specifically, in a very specific way. But it, in truth, it's your imagination of what that way is. So yeah. just get really specific about it. Write it down. Try writing out what a working relationship is and what it would look like. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. So the, the second thing that comes up a lot, which is what your TED Talk is about, is, well, maybe that's fine for other people, non-monogamy, but I could never do it because I'd be too jealous. You know, I, I there's no way that I would want to deal with those kinds of emotions or handle those kinds of emotions. So this is where I'd just love for you to just start talking because you're so good at talking about this I do talk about jealousy a lot. I, I mean, I, I love jealousy. I have befriended jealousy. Um, we have a deal. Um, but unfortunately, that deal isn't like, oh, I don't bother you. You don't bother me. And unfortunately, jealousy and I made a deal in which I research jealousy every day of my life and she bugs the heck out of me. And <laughs> that's okay. Jealousy is not... When I hear somebody say, I could never because I am a jealous person, first right off the bat. Maybe we could remove that identifier from ourselves because mm -hmm. do you describe yourself as a sad person, an angry person? Ideally, if we describe ourselves as, as a person with one emotion, ideally we go seek help. This is a, That's a great thing to take to your counselor, to take that in and say, oh, I am hyper identifying with this one emotion as if it is it rules me. Yeah, That, that would be worth looking at. But even beyond that, um, I have interviewed now hundreds of people formally, and nobody has ever described to me, thousands of people informally at this point, nobody's ever described to me the education they got on how to work with jealousy. And mm -hmm. I ask directly, so mm -hmm. tell me, when's the first time somebody sat you down and talked about how to deal with your jealous feelings? 
Nobody has ever had a single memory to share with me. Wow. Even the people who could describe like, oh, yeah, I remember, you know, kicking somebody at school and getting sat down and talked to about anger. Or mm -hmm. I remember my mom had depression and at first nobody talked about it. But then somebody finally broke the silence and we really started talking about what it meant to be sad and, and mm -hmm. what we could do with sadness. And, and then the movie Inside Out came out and we all started talking about emotions a little bit more, right? Yeah, but yeah. jealousy got missed. And actually, I'm really interested to see whether they pick up. I wonder what they'll do with jealousy in the new Inside Out movie that's coming out because they're oh. picking up some more complex emotions. That'll be interesting. interesting. But, I didn't know we're doing that. I'm excited. Yeah. Teenage emotions. So Ooh. great place to pick up jealousy. The, the trouble with jealousy is that it's a complex emotion, right? So it's either, depending on which framework of jealousy, model of jealousy you use, either jealousy is made of a bunch of other more primal emotions or it's a primal emotion, but it comes pack in other emotions every time. It just does. That's its nature. It comes with what I describe as a flavor. So when you get jealous, do you get angry? Do you get sad? Do you feel ashamed because it's bad to be jealous? Um, do you feel overwhelmed? And also you start to slip then into guilt. And now what do I do? Because now I'm trying. Guilt isn't even shame. Jealousy comes with so many different emotions, including envy which we tend to conflate with jealousy. Mm -hmm. So we can sort those out. But when I think about jealousy, I think, what would it look like for people to talk about jealousy like it was normal? Because in the research studies I've done, people who had normalized the idea that jealousy just is, there's nothing wrong with it and there's nothing wrong with you for feeling it, nor does it necessarily mean that anything is wrong. We need to, we need to sort it out. Mm -hmm. So frequently, we think that jealousy means either something's wrong with me or something's wrong with you and how you're behaving in our relationship. Either one of those needs to be ended right away. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense because jealousy is an emotion that we can spot in infants as young as five and six months old. So since that's true, it's wired into my neurobiology so early. Of course, it's hard for me to get a hold of myself. However, Lots and lots of people have figured out how to work with jealousy productively. Mm -hmm. um, and the great news is they're talking about it. They're talking about what they do. So there's actually a pretty clear path for working with it. That doesn't mean it won't hurt. It doesn't mean it won't come up and be difficult. Yeah. But we don't have to treat it as any different than anger or sadness or shame. We don't put it in the dark. We don't disown it. We work with it. No, I, I, I kind of love that. I mean, I think that jealousy used to be kind of this normal thing that you were expected and even taught to respond with, especially with relationships, romantic relationships. Then we kind of went through this phase where you're not supposed to be a controlling partner. Yep. And so then I think jealousy kind of got this a shame attached to it. Like, oh, I'm not supposed to be jealous. I'm supposed to be cool and level-headed. And, and so now there's shame with the jealousy. I, yeah. And I, I, I guess I hadn't heard that we can feel it as soon as five months. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So if you um, want to look at those studies, so um, Sybil Hart has studies, there's some really interesting studies. What they did is, so their mother child studies, um, their primary caregiver and the child, right? So you put the mother and child in this situation where they're looking at their baby and paying attention to their infant baby. And then they turn their attention to a book. And you see, you look for like, what does the child do? What does the infant do? But now give mom or parent or caregiver the lifelike appearance of a doll that they can attend to. They react very differently. They understand that it is a threat for their bond to be interrupted. And at that phase, at five months old, it is legitimately a threat if they were to be completely usurped because they're helpless. Mm -hmm. And then we never really talk about it. We just grow up. And when we're toddlers, we're told to share everything um, or we're told very little, if anything, just like there's just nothing said. And it, jealousy just kind of falls into the background and it becomes just like a cartoon character. You know, you'll see like a green witchy type face in a cartoon that's like labeled as jealousy. But nobody really sits and talks about it with us. Yeah. Often people confuse it with envy, right? So they get it all tangled up. Then we're not even sorting these two emotions out. Fast forward to our adolescence. And yeah, then if somebody's not jealous of you, now you have a different problem. 
<laughs> because yeah, we prize jealousy in our romantic songs, in our films, in our literature, in our mythology. Jealousy is a mark of love. It's a mark of ardor, of, of intensity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though it's also, last study I saw, 74% of domestic violence cases mm -hmm. had jealousy listed in some of their rationale, what was going on. Yeah. So it can, jealousy is problematic when it comes to how people deal with it. And yeah. yet its roots are incredibly natural. There's there's nothing wrong with feeling jealousy. But since we're not taught what to do with it, it's not actually surprising that it turns into malignant behavior. It turns into unhelpful behavior frequently. Yeah. Right. And even controlling behavior, which is what, yeah. yeah. So can you give the audience a bit of how you're defining jealousy versus envy? I think that's an interesting difference. Yeah. Um, I, I like to sort these two out really clearly because I work with jealousy and envy differently. So jealousy, I define as a an emotion that is a perceived threat to my valuable relationship. So you can always spot jealousy because there's a triangle. There's myself, my beloved, and the perceived interrupter, whoever it is. They don't have to be a real perceived interrupter, like they might be a friend or somebody at a bar. They might also be the person who I imagine out of a whole bunch of Instagram likes. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be real. Well, or Envy, like a, a porn star or. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Anyone who I perceive that my partner can, can put energy to and might interrupt us. And the more realistic that threat is in my mind, the more intense the jealousy is probably going to be. But Absolutely. People can feel pathological levels of jealousy over completely unreasonable situations. So jealousy is just about identify that triangle. You know, jealousy is at work. Envy, on the other hand, is about a dyad. Envy is about longing to be what someone is or have what someone else has. Very different energy there. It's it's this energy of of longing. It can also be motivating. Like if if I if my best friend has um, a car that I want, maybe I'm motivated to change my life. So I have this car. If my um, if my partner gets a promotion and I'm both happy for them, but also like a little envious because now they're going to earn more than I am, right? That kind of envy, we kind of understand. But the trouble with envy is it can also exist right alongside with jealousy. So now I have the triangle, but I might also be envious of the perceived interrupter. I might be body shaming myself or imagining that they are funnier or more valuable, more powerful, stronger, better looking, whatever. And now I've got envy over this interrupter that's just between they and I, and also my jealousy, which may be leading me to want to control the situation, maybe wanting, I may be wanting to fix something or change my partner's behavior or attention patterns. Wow. It's not uncommon for them to overlap. Yeah, no, that's great. I think that's super helpful. And I think too, like some people would say, well, but how about if the threat isn't just perceived, you know, what if I'm jealous for good reason, yeah. <laughs> whatever good reason might be, but what would you say to that? Well, I really appreciate that um, lots of researchers have gone to great trouble to define different types of jealousy. And one of my favorite is to just call out rational jealousy. Sometimes jealousy is completely rational. Um, your sometimes your partner is actually being infidelitous. There, sometimes your relationship is legitimately under threat, mm -hmm. and so this is why I tell people I'm not trying to cure your jealousy. I'm not trying to make jealousy go away. I'm not trying to remove it from your psyche. I have a lot of people, especially in non-monogamy circles, a lot of times people will try to transcend jealousy. They just don't want to feel it anymore. I actually don't work with jealousy that way at all. I would never recommend that because jealousy is there for a reason. And my archetypal perspective says, if Psyche puts something here, it's for a reason. And that reason to me is to alert me to when I feel a, an, an interception that could happen and to remind me to turn my attention back to my relationship and whether it actually is functioning the way I think a relationship should. Uh, are we communicating? Do we have clear agreements? Is my partner able to observe boundaries? If none of those things are happening, we actually have a legitimate problem. Great. That's, we need to seek out help, not just blame someone and, and get, and, and toss the word jealousy around as if it's something to get rid of but instead to address the problem that the jealousy is alerting us to. 
Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like one of the, one of the first things we want to do is just kind of like do an assessment, you know, is this like many of our feelings, you know, right. yeah, and anxiety, confusion, is it, is, is it, are these feelings here for a real purpose? Are they actually alerting me to actual things or am I over identifying somehow or feeling this feeling for other reasons that are not that, that don't make right. as logical sense? Right. Look at me. It gets a little confusing because if there is another person actually in the relational sphere, right, in the constellation, there might actually be some interruption happening. You might actually be experiencing a loss of attention, and that's not necessarily inherently problematic. If you are in a an agreed upon explicit, yes, I want this. I want to learn how to work with this. Now we have to do the deeper work of okay, how do, I, how do I learn to sit with my discomfort and understand that there's a difference between being uncomfortable and actually being harmed? Because not every time my partner turns their attention away is harm to me. And this is, again, where we have to come back to, are we enmeshed? Um, do I believe that I need to have control over my partner? Um, or can I actually trust them to operate within the boundaries of our related relationship agreement. And this is where I, I usually find out that people have relationship philosophies more than relationship agreements. They're like, well, this is just how it should feel or how it should be. And I'm like, well, but do you have an agreement? Do you actually talk about how this would look in real life? And that is another skill. We just generally aren't taught to actually negotiate about I want this. You want that. How do we figure out what to do here? Right. Well, and the problem with philosophies is that they usually can become a bit like dogma where this is the right way. You know, how I formulate my philosophy of relationship, that should be the right way. And now why aren't you just getting on board with my philosophy right. is, is oftentimes what's happening. When I teach people, oftentimes people come into me like, and when they're describing their relationship, their thoughts on relationship and how they have agreements, they're usually describing these broad, vague philo philosophical statements. And I ask them to set those aside for a little while and instead walk through very intentionally learning to make agreements the way I wish we all learned to make agreements when we were kids and teenagers and young adults and step through that process again so that we can negotiate in a very clear way um, about very small containers of things. Like let's make smaller agreements and practice what happens, what happens when our agreements, what, what happens if I'm a person who over promises or fawns and makes agreements that I don't actually intend to keep because I would rather ask forgiveness than permission. Um, what happens if I believe that we should always be asking each other permission? What if I can't grant my partner any actual agency and autonomy? What's going on there? Right. So usually we have to step through this really patiently. And it's only at the very end of at least a whole year of working together that I say, now, if you've been experimenting this whole year and we've been stepping through all these methods, now you could consider what would be the ph the philosophical underpinnings of your relationships? And then I ask people to revisit it every year because I don't want it to become dogmatic ever. It's so antithetical to our humanity. Right, right. Well, and I think one of the philosophies that we're dealing with in non-monogamy is the philosophy that true love, soulmate love, whatever type of love that we've romanticized or you know have certain ideas about, is kind of the sense that you only have eyes for one other person that your, you know, your passion and your, um, whatever, especially your sexual interest should not be given to anybody else. And, and so of course I do think that when you're challenging that very basic philosophy about relationships, this is where people feel that threat, you know, whether yeah. it's imagined or, or real, it's like, it's at least threatening the philosophy style. <laughs> well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's where too, people can feel threatened about the whole idea of non-monogamy, right? I have people get very angry at me sometimes on, you know, YouTube comment threads and such. Um, they get angry because I exist out loud and I just share my very consensual really, really, really ridiculously happy non-monogamy. Like it's almost gross. It's so happy. Um, and it's upsetting because that, like that 
it, it really chips away at the idea of there's one right way to experience soulmate love. And anybody who's heard my story with my anchor partner knows that it sure as heck looks, smells, and feels like soulmate love. And we don't practice that ownership model. And if for a lot of us, that just, it feels like there's too much cognitive dissonance. It feels like there's grit in the gears if we, when we try to contemplate that. So it takes time to unpack that. It's okay if you feel uncomfortable thinking about someone else loving your person, your person, right? Because that's okay. Like you can be uncomfortable with it. Just hold the tension. Right now, the growth point for you might just be holding the tension of what if it weren't uncomfortable to have your partner care about someone else? What if it weren't? What what might feel lighter in your body? What might feel easier? What um, what challenges might go away? And just play with those level. I'm very all about like working with this in the imagination before we take it to the practical. People so often go right to the practical, but it's, yeah, imagination first from my perspective. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think why aren't we using our creativity and our imagination to play, to get used to playing? Even, okay. even just regular sex amongst monogamous couples oftentimes is not playful. Okay. <laughs> and so just getting in touch with play and creativity and imagination can be a great first step. Okay, so, I, and I love, by the way, that you say you're ridiculously happy in this lifestyle, because again, usually when we talk about this subject, it seems a little bit like, don't, don't, don't. Or when I'm interviewed about this subject, it's like, but all these problems and I'm just trying to, you know, keep an optimist. <laughs> right. An optimist. Like, yourself. really? It might not be so bad. So I'm glad. I mean, yes, there's, of course, there's problems, there's risks to any relational structure, but in of, in of itself, it's not. I think the only real risk to non-monogamy is that it's not socially acceptable. And anytime you have a group of people trying to navigate any type of lifestyle that is not socially acceptable, that's going to have some extra, you know, like, right. oh, like microaggressions and things that you're dealing with that, that right. other people just take for granted. Right. And this is one of the reasons, I mean, if you're watching me on Facebook Live, you can see me. So I am a cisgender, white, um, apparently able-bodied. Um, I was I, upper middle class, raised, um, raised poor, but raised with this, all of this privilege that lets me walk around the world feeling relatively safe, even as a woman, even knowing the violence rates against women, relatively safe. I live in an area where my body autonomy is more privileged as well. So with all that privilege, I feel it makes sense for me to be out and to be and to be really verbal about the fact that, yeah, if you were to see me on the street with my with my anchor partner or with any of my other partners, like one at a time, you would think, well, there's just a happy, regular person. I would look boring as heck. If you saw me with all my kids getting out of my ridiculously huge van, you'd think there is a boring soccer mom. Yeah, boring, wholesome polyamory exists. And often people can't actually talk about it for other risk factors. And that is a horrible reality. And the more marginalized identity as a person holds, the worse that becomes. So I feel really, really, really lucky that I get to stand here publicly saying, yep, that's my life and I'm happy. And I am in a secure enough situation that when someone tries to attack me or feel make me feel bad about this, I can also, generally speaking, protect myself by simply excising that person from my life. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can do that. Um, some people are facing this problem like from their family, from their friends. I did lose a circle of friends when I first came out. They just all bailed. It sucked. That yeah. really sucked. Yeah. And that's still happening. So I don't want anybody to feel the pressure to come out. But there's also really interesting dynamics to think about because now I often, when I'm out dating, I am often in the position of kind of being someone's secret even though they may not want it to be that way, they may still be a, adhering to social monogamy because they're scared. And that's really tough. It's tough for everybody involved. So ideally, it's conversations like this, whether someone is interested in non-monogamy for themselves or not, when we just look at the statistics of how many people are living in non-monogamous realities, 
you know people. It's the same number of people as who have cats or play musical instruments. You know people who are not monogamous. So if you can just like allow your imagination to soften around this and say, yeah, this is really just another way that people exist in the world, whether that is a lifestyle choice for them, whether it's an identity for them, whether it flows right up out of them like an orientation, it really doesn't matter. It's them. That's them. Love them as they are. I love it. So you've been talking about, okay, we're, we're not really taught how to deal with jealousy and your whole TED talk was about compersion. So can we dive into that really fast? It's one tool. I think yeah. it's a big one. <laughs> so can you, I don't even know that everybody, know, I'm still kind of, I guess, cause I've been doing this work for a while. I'm still kind of surprised when people come into my clinic and they don't know what the word compersion means. And I'm like, oh yeah, let's, let's start there. Let's talk about this word. Yeah. Well, darn it. It's still not in the dictionary. So, and um, so my friend and researcher, Marie Tuin and I have, she is one of the preeminent compersion researchers in our country. And um, we've been talking about how like both of us have requested to have this word entered into the dictionary lexicon. I believe we're on the cusp. I really think in the next year or two, it just, it's not going anywhere. It's been wow. around. This word was coined back in the nineties. Um, it was coined in the non-monogamy community, but it works for everyone. Compersion is this juicy word that helps you understand the feeling of joy for your partner's joy, even if that has nothing to do with you. And when I take that out of the non-monogamous world and I say, well, if your partner is out with their friends and they're having a good time, are you jealous or are you happy for them? And sometimes they might say, yeah, I do feel a little jealousy. I do feel a little threatened. Okay, cool. Let's work on that because your partner gets to have friends. Um, <laughs> and also, you might just not know that there's a word for when you feel like, oh, yeah, they are out having a great time. They're out doing an activity they love. They're with people who love them. And you feel all warm and bubbly inside. That's compersion. Mm -hmm. Most of us have experienced compersion in our bodies at some point. But then when we apply it to the non-monogamous container and we say, what if you felt that same way about your partner having intimacy with someone else, whether that's sexual or romantic or whatever kind of intimacy? What if you felt that warm, bubbly feeling? Or what if you just believed? What if you had attitudinal compersion and you just leaned into like, yeah, I I really want that for them. My body might not quite be on board yet, but I'm I'm there. I'm there intellectually. That's attitudinal and embodied compersion. And both of them are yummy and delicious. And if you want to know more, I would actually recommend people go to Marie's website, whatiscompersion.com, because um, mm. she's got some great, really simple handouts about compersion. Um, and my Jealousy Roadmap is over there too. Okay. I will we'll definitely like link to all those things. Yeah. I, I love this. I talk to people about this all the time. And I, and I do think most of us have this, we definitely have it for our children. Mm -hmm. we love them so much. We're super happy when they're happy. So what, what I like to point out to people is that this is not some, this is not you doing something in behalf of somebody else. This is actually about your pleasure. Yeah. So you don't have to do this like a self a conversion doesn't become, especially in my circle, the new self-sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not going to help. That's not going to help us. <laughs> like I should be compersive and the new shame, <laughs> like you know, somehow not. No, this is actually to serve you. Like you get pleasure from somebody else's pleasure. And sometimes it is a skill that we need to develop because again, we've been taught so many messages that have told us actually to not feel this way or to not behave in this way. So um, and I love to how you talk about it becoming attitudinal first, right? I always say it takes a minute for things to marinate into your bones. Right. <laughs> Usually shifts happen up here first, right? But then it, you know, it takes your emotions and your body some time to catch up. Right. Just think about it. You learn the word and then you start identifying places that are easy for you. If I watch a little kid eating ice cream, um, I was interviewed by NPR. They made a cute little cartoon out of it. It was so cute. Um, I watch a little kid eating ice cream. I'm lactose intolerant. I can still be super jazzed and excited for them having their ice cream, right? So we practice super easy, bite-sized little pieces of it. And then we just transfer it to more and more like edgy places in our life. For a lot of us, a great place to practice compersion is our close friendships because a lot of us are 
harboring envy and jealousy around our close friendships that could absolutely be super beneficial to work on and might feel just a step easier than our most intimate romantic relationships, even though I have some issues about, I don't know, some of those fr friendships are really romantic, but <laughs> um, I love the idea of just taking this to your friendships. If you're not ready to take it to your romantic relationships, because if you can learn to um, embrace compersion and foster it, nurture it, then you've got another, yeah, skill, but also you just like, you have another source of joy in your life. Joy for another's joy. Yeah. Who doesn't want that? I love it. And again, this can help monogamous folks as well, because we inherently will have different tastes, different preferences, different fantasies. Um, and instead of, again, feeling threatened that our partner would even, and you know, have some of those ideas, we can just be like, that's, that's great. Even if it's in your own brain or in your own imagination, I'm glad that you have the capacity to have, you know, some relationship with sexuality that's different than mine. And, and it doesn't have to be this kind of threatening punitive thing. So I love that. Is there, is there anything else you want to share as far as a tool or a strategy to help with jealousy in particular, before I ask you a few more questions? Yeah, I think the, the one thing that I would just like to point out. So we talked about actually, the jealousy roadmap just helps you walk through, like, what do I need to do? We talked about naming it, getting to know how it feels in my body, identifying its flavor. Um, but most people jump right to trying to solve it. They jump to like navigating their needs and trying to negotiate around their needs. But there's a missing step. Step three for me in the jealousy roadmap is people who who understood what their narrative of jealousy is. Like, what's the story I tell myself about what jealousy means? Do I have a secret? Am I harboring a secret, maybe even from myself, around jealousy being valuable? And if jealousy isn't there, something's wrong. Or do I get off on jealousy? Personally, okay, 30% of my research um, participants have shared that jealousy is arousing for them. I fall into that category too. Some of us are aroused by jealousy. So we need to talk about the narrative, the story that we're telling ourselves about jealousy. And that can happen anywhere. That can happen, yes, with your counselors. That can happen with your friends. That can happen in any place, any circle that you're talking about emotions. What if we can center jealousy for an evening and just talk about it as if we were coming to it for the first time and really take a beginner's mind to it. Um, I think that that is, that goes beyond just my personal work with jealousy and into the collective work on jealousy. And I really think that we're on the cusp of being able to have some major cultural breakthroughs around jealousy if we have these conversations regularly and in small circles where it's safe to say the uncomfortable stuff. Yeah. I love that. Well, and, and really kind of your call to action, although you didn't call it to action, but to do this as parents, to yes. talk to our kids about jealousy, right. And, yeah. and to sh talk about sharing toys and how that is hard and not just expect the sharing to come naturally, <laughs> or, you know, or to, to give voice to those feelings and how do we work through some of those feelings and, you know, I and, and help them watch what, because jealousy is telling them that they care about someone. Right. It, and help them watch that and understand like that's a huge emotional education. The first time I sometimes I'll be meeting with somebody who's in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and we'll be talking about their jealousy. And when they first really feel in their bones that jealousy is the primary indicator they have that they care about their partner. Damn, that would have been really nice to know when they were five, right? To just know throughout their life that it's an indicator. And now they need to figure out what to do with that to turn that jealousy into actual care instead of control, to turn that jealousy into something productive for their so that they actually are in relationship to the other. And I do think that that starts with our kids. And I mean, my kids now are ages 16 to 24. And I didn't do a perfect job at it either. I was just barely scratching the surface of my own research. If I could go back and do it all over again, I would start from the time they were nursing at my breast. I would I would walk them through what like what is this feeling that you're feeling when you're the toddler and you're like trying to push the newborn away? What is the what what's going on there? I would start talking about it then. Mm, I love that. I love that so much. You started off this interview before we pressed record saying that you have some new results to research as of today. 
Can you share with us what, what's the research you've been doing and what you have access to now? Yeah. So um, actually, yeah, just today, uh, a study was released in Cogent Mental Health, which is a journal from Taylor and Francis. And I was the primary author in this study. It is a comparison of the experience, the lived experience of jealousy in women um, when they're in both monogamous and non-monogamous relationships. I wanted to see what's the difference, what's going on for people who are working with jealousy in these two seemingly very different relationship structures. Um, P.S. I did collect data for men and non-binary people, but those data samples came in later, so they'll be in future research. But for right now, there's this great paper. It happens to have been published open access, which means anybody can read it. And what I love about this is it did show some differences. I did not go, I didn't go into this knowing whether there would be any differences at all because jealousy is messy and it's hard for people. And sometimes, yes, people in non-monogamy circles can sometimes be like, highfalutin and say like, I'm more evolved. But most of us know this is just hard. It's mm-hmm. it's hard to work with big emotions. Mm-hmm. But there were a couple of really big differences. They're, they're simple. They're very, very simple, but they're big. The first was um, most of the monogamous participants didn't have any place to talk about jealousy. It just mm-hmm. wasn't something because your monogamy is supposed to protect you from jealousy. So if you start talking about it now, you can face shame or judgment about what's going on in your relationship, even though your jealousy is yours and it could be springing up for no real external reason at all. Um, So there's just no place to talk about it. And on top of that, there's this um, lack of nuance to what jealousy is. Um, Very, the only people in, in the study who were monogamous and knew the word um, compersion, for instance, were therapists who worked with non-monogamous clients. So they only knew it because they'd been educated by their clients about this word. So there's just a lack of some of the most amazing tools, language. Um, and that's so easy rem- to remedy. We can remedy that for ourselves right now, like a little bit of education. So I would tell anyone who's struggling with jealousy or who's watching a friend struggle with jealousy, To educate themselves on jealousy from a non-monogamous perspective, even if you want to apply it to a monogamous container, go see what are they doing? Because this is a place where people are intentionally putting themselves into containers where they know they're going to face jealousy. And the longer people had been in those containers, the more the research shows that they had come to find ways, strategies that worked for them to deal with it. And they're pretty straightforward ways, but they weren't shamed about their jealousy and they weren't taking it on. They weren't internalizing it as this is a bad thing or this means something bad about my relationship. It is just a feeling to work with. I love that. I mean, yeah, you kind of assume that I love how you said monogamy will protect you from jealousy, but that's, it's not what's showing up in my clinic. (laughs) (laughs) No, no. And 2000 years of literature, uh, like tells it like mythology, every film we have, like Clearly, monogamy is not protecting us from jealousy, or we wouldn't have all of this amazing um, fiction around us. <laughs> right, right. Were there other things that you found out in the research as well? Well, something else that stood out to me was that there's, um, and this actually isn't in this particular piece of research. It, it's going to be in future research. It's that um, the the way that the way that I went about collecting the data, I thought, oh, I'll get everybody to come into the container all at once. It was really hard to get the men to show up to the container, like mm-hmm. really hard. For like, for every interview I held, four people bailed on their interview. Like they, it was a lot more, ten- there was a lot more tension in coming to and having the discussion. And so that is not, I have not published those results yet because I only finished kind of like collecting the data on the men um, right at the end of last year. But yeah, there's something there. Like, <laughs> we meaning that men don't the container yeah. meaning that they were going to come and talk about jealousy. Come, yeah, they were going to come out. talk so about jealousy, thinking. and they said they would, and then they backed out. Said they so would, backed out. Sure. And then the ones who did show up, it took time for them to sink in and be like, "Oh yeah, I'm really, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to talk about my jealousy." Um, I, and my inclination, this is very early in looking at the what the actual results will be. Is there's there's just a huge stigma around naming jealousy in any way other than violence, 
We mm -hmm. know that violence is a way that pe men are expressing their jealousy. We see it in in the forensic statistics. Like we're seeing that. That's very clear. So we need to take jealousy out of the closet. We need to talk about it like it's a normal thing that happens and something that absolutely has remedies way before anything ever touches violence or control. Yeah. But we got to have those conversations in our, again, this is a cultural level conversation that needs to happen in small circles all over the place. It's not top down. We really need, we need to be talking to our friends. Men need to be talking to men. We, we need to have these conversations and normalize talking about the discomfort that we're sitting with when jealousy comes up and then starting to notice again, what we said at the beginning, am I uncomfortable or am I being harmed? And start to discern that. Because I think if we could discern that, we'd have better outcomes when it yeah. comes to jealousy. Yeah. So it's, it sound, if I'm if I'm hearing you right, your thoughts are because we've tied jealousy to violence so much and men who don't want to identify as violent or don't see themselves as violent, they can't even think about having that emotion because somehow that would mean I'm a violent person. And a lot of times then they escape it by saying, I don't have any. I, I don't, I don't feel any, or je I'll, another thing that I hear frequently is, um, I, it's just, jealousy is just insecurity and I'm, I'm not insecure. So I would never feel jealous. Like, yeah, okay, right. well then somebody explain those DV stats to me because huh. this is not lining up. The, yeah. So if, and if, and if we could understand too, that jealousy itself, it comes in lots of sizes, right? So way before it gets to violence, it has shown up in all of these little ouches, and if we could talk about little ouches without trying to control our partners and instead negotiating with our partners what we actually want to have in our agreements, I mean, the whole game changes. Everything changes then. But it's... That's yeah. actually pretty huge because, yes, I do think that the proclivity towards violence is greater when we don't have all those outlets leading up to potential violence. So I think that's, that's pretty big. I love what you just said about insecurity. That's another myth I hear a lot. Jealousy is all about being insecure. You can be a very secure person and still feel threatened that you're going to lose one of your primary relationships. Right. So right. anything else you want to say about that, just to kind of clarify? Well, I, I just, I think it's worth really being clear that what you said is true, that my sense of security in myself is completely different from my sense of security in my partnerships. And most of us are existing in partnerships that are not clearly negotiated. They're not explicit, um, or we're dealing with some kind of trust violations in the past, stuff's going on. And all of that means that I'm, I am open to the potential of feeling, yes, dips in the security about my relationship. And if that's true, that's not actually a problem. If I feel a dip in that security, again, I could turn my attention back to the relationship and like, okay, what do I need to do? Because if I do feel, let's say I feel really good about myself, I feel like, yep, I'm doing, I'm living the life I'm meant to live. I'm even communicating from my end in my relationship. I'm asking for what I need. I'm stating clear boundaries. I'm doing all that. What if I keep partnering with people who aren't willing to do that from their side? Now I can have relational insecurity for a lot of different reasons. And the key word for me is if somebody says jealousy is just, insert any word, I am highly suspicious. Having now spent so many years researching jealousy and feeling jealous myself, let's not put the just word in front of it. It's a huge emotional cauldron. And some of us are more susceptible to the feeling than others. So also some people, lucky them, um, just have a really high tolerance. They, their threshold for experiencing jealousy is really high. My anchor partner happens to be one of those people. He talks about it pretty frequently on our podcast where he just doesn't have, it's not that he never feels jealousy, but his threshold for feeling it in any sort of intense way, and he's been put to the test, we're, we're non-monogamous, and I am very active in my ways. Um, he doesn't have that trigger, yeah. but I do. That's normal. It's normal to experience things in a range. He feels sadness way faster than I do. He'll tear up at a Hallmark commercial. And I'm like, what is going on with you? I just don't feel anything, right? We're different. But if a lot of times people who do happen to have 
or have only experienced relationships where they felt like they could totally tolerate whatever jealousy they did have, a lot of times they're dismissive of partners who do experience a low threshold for jealousy. They really, they struggle with it. And there's some belittling that goes on there or some, and then, and now what we're doing is we're taking and saying jealousy, a lot of those same people will say jealousy is about insecurity. So if you feel jealousy, you're insecure. Great. That tells me that I'm insecure. So now I'm, in, I'm insecure because I'm insecure. Wait, all you did was give them a tautology to deal with. I would strongly recommend instead supporting that person to figure out what exactly is going on for them. What kind of jealousy are they having? Um, what tools would they like to have in their life? And a lot of people need reassurance when jealousy comes up. And for some reason, a lot of us think we're not allowed to ask for it. But we totally can. One of the like, yeah, right. Like, like we're fostering codependence or something. And I'm like, we're still pack animals, people. We still need each other. (laughs) Right, right. Like, it's like the pendulum swings so far over that then we're like, I'm not responsible for your feelings. That's not what I said. If your partner is asking for reassurance that you love them, that you care for them, give it. But like, yeah, yeah, like, and they're they may have a higher need for that than you do, and if that need is not something you're willing to meet, then the two of you might not be a good fit, because you might not be able to meet that need. That's okay. So that might be one of the reasons why people don't continue a particular partnership, but belittling or demeaning a partner for having a need for reassurance is ridiculous and antithetical to working with jealousy in a productive way because we want to name it. We want to notice how it feels in our bodies. And then we want to work with it as a completely natural emotion. And if you don't want your partner to be controlling around their jealousy, then for goodness sakes, you're going to have to offer them the reassurance that they don't need to be. Yes. No, I, I, amen, amen, amen. I, because the, these blame games go back and forth. It's like, well, you're too needy. Well, you're too non-attached, you know, well, you're too this, you're, and we are different and we have to figure out how to negotiate those differences. Right. And so I think I love that. All right. One last question, because I know we're running out of time and I don't want to take advantage of your <laughs> very valuable time, but I, sometimes I see some infighting kind of within the non-monogamy space, meaning like, for example, I work with a lot of folks who are in a primary relationship, maybe an anchor relationship, however they may term that, have been monogamous primarily most of their lives and are now opening up their relationship and want to do that as a couple. So a very typical way that I see that happening out of the many ways is that they might start with swinging or soft swapping or something along those lines. Um, And then, and that can go, okay. But for some reason, I think they they're um, there's almost this feeling like, well, if we if there's no emotional connection, if we're just doing the physical parts of it, then we will avoid jealousy. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and then sure enough, usually along the line, somebody kind of shifts their mind about what kinds of agreements I may want. Or some people may feel actually more jealousy just from the physical component than they had imagined even though there isn't as much emotionality attached and they may feel safer in emotional attached relationships because then it doesn't, it's so complicated, right? How people will show up, but it does feel like in the lifestyle, sometimes I have heard people kind of put down polyamory because that's not the right kind of non-monogamy or polyamorous people can put down, you know, the swingers or the, you know, because that's not the right kind of non-monogamy. So I just wonder... (laughs) Yeah. What, any thoughts you have about the the infighting just even within the population? Right. I mean, I think it is it is a normal human um, quality, right, to find, to start creating in-group, out-group situations, um, at least in modern Western white cis patriarchy. It is very normal, right? And we have the psychological studies to show in-group, out-group is a thing, right? And so, gosh darn it, even in amongst a marginalized population, we will take and start dividing ourselves up and say, I'm doing it the right way, you're doing it the wrong way. And sometimes we'll actually point the finger at ourselves. I have some people who'll show up and they'll say like, yeah, but like, I'm just a swinger. I don't know whether I get to go to these like support meetings. I don't know whether I get to have, I'm like, "Mm, mm." Mm -hmm. for one thing, again, we're growing, changing people. We don't know where the paths will lead. So waiting until I... 
I feel like claiming a particular identity in order to receive education and support around my relationships feels ridiculous to me. So like in my program, the year of opening, we're opening to ourselves. We're opening up. We're figuring out who we are. Some people are single and they're exploring like, okay, what would it look like to create um, connection without the imagination of monogamy being like the sole imagination that I have? And some people are partnered and they're like, okay, we're going to figure this out, but we don't know. Maybe, what if all we want is swinging? Is that okay? And my response to that will be, it's totally okay, but let's make sure that your agreements cover the fact that just because that's what you want today doesn't mean it's what both of you will want tomorrow. And what do we do if we want polyamory or we want relationship anarchy, but our partner that we currently have doesn't want it. How do I negotiate around that without othering them, without blaming, without starting to, again, like tear and pull? Because everybody involved wants more love, though they may struggle to name that. Like if everybody wants this to be a more loving world, I, I don't know anybody personally, like in my personal life, who I'd say, oh, they really want to create a, a world filled with hate. Um, at high levels, we may have some issues like that. But <laughs> when I think about these folks, I think if they understood that that there's a way to talk about this, this opening process as just an exploration and that everybody is going to figure out how it works for them in their own time frame. And for some people, it's going to take years of going through different um, ideas, different ways of playing out in the world of exploring to even be able to tolerate the idea of either emotions or sexual connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're just humans out there, humaning they're, that that's all. So again, we're back to not just tolerating, but actually embracing the fact that they're, they're actively creating the relationships that they want to have. How can I support this person in front of me doing that? It's that's that's my goal. So whether they're my neighbor, my partner, my friend, my child, because um, a lot of us are going to have kids come home to us and say, can I bring both of my partners? Like it's going to happen to more and more of us. Gen Z, Gen yeah, Alpha, are, they are going this way, right? And, and monogamy in this economy? Now. Come on. <laughs> right. So parents telling me my 13 year old is saying that they're having non-monogamous crushes and they're using all this language and parents are like, what is yeah. happening? You know, because, <laughs> because most of us were if like, if you just think back in the day, didn't you ever have a crush on two people at the same time when you were 12 years old? Like, like, sure. Yeah. I mean, it happens all the time. So now these kids have the language because they also have social media or they have friends who understand this language. It's the language accessibility that shifted. If I had known this when I was a teenager, I would have been out the whole time. Instead, I, I married somebody under the pretense of monogamy, knowing that I consistently fell in love with multiple people at a time. I married him. I got engaged when I was 17, married when I was 20, made promises. I absolutely, it was breaking my heart to keep. And I kept them as long as I could. And then when I learned the word polyamory, yeah. I was like, uh-oh. Yeah, that goes back to the risk factor that I think our culture, oftentimes our more traditional conservative culture, um, requires people to make promises that they have no business making. Yeah, right? yeah. Especially like, Especially at ages where we're not fully developed, during times when we have, you know, so much adult development left to go in life. And, and it's just, it's just, um, it's almost set up to fail in that regard. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I know uh, when my, when I came out, one of the things that people, my elders said to me over and over again, they knew I was bi the whole time, by the way. So they, like I'd been out as bisexual since I was a kid, but people would say, well, why do you need that? Why, like, why do you need to come out and tell us you're non-monogamous? Why does this need to be a thing? And the conversation for me was around, well, because this is one, who I am. Two, I still want to have conversations with you. And three, I'm not going to hide it from my kids as a possibility. Even if at the end of all this exploration, I'm like, you know what? I, I'm going to, I am going to do monogamy for whatever reason, maybe because it's easier, maybe because I can't figure out this polyamory thing. I am not going to hide it from my kids because if I had known the language, 
everything I did early on would have been colored differently. And that would have given me the ability to at least understand what it was I was promising to do. Because if I chose monogamy and I committed to a monogamous relationship, having known that non-monogamy was a legitimate choice I could make, that would have been a completely different place. Different. Completely different. I love that. So yeah, so your your motivation is not just your own authenticity, but to offer your children possibilities in their lives as far as what would be the best fit for them. So that's just really beautiful. Okay. So Jolie, this is your time now to just share with us everything you're doing. What are you offering? Where, where can people find you? What I know you've written a book, like just tell us all the, the wonderful Dr. Hamilton things. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you the easiest thing. If you're wondering whether non-monogamy is for you, go to joliequiz.com. J-O-L-I-Q-U-I-Z. Go to joliequiz.com. It's a 10 question quiz based on my research that'll just help you understand where you're at right now in your current relationship education from like, oh yeah, I, we are ready to go. We could open up or I could be in an open relationship all the way to, oh, things are kind of a hot mess and we need some foundations. Just get your feet under you and understand this. And even if you're just curious, pop over there, check it out. Um, because that also gives you a sense of like, oh, what are the questions somebody would ask about what it feels like to want non-monogamy? And then if the jealousy, if jealousy, oh, if jealousy, if jealousy is bothering you, um, I invite you to go to um, jealousyroadmap.com. In there, you'll see my Jealousy Roadmap. That is a 20-page booklet where I outline the steps that people who are working with jealousy in my research studies, the, these are the steps that evolved right from them. They're already doing this. Let's learn from the people who are successfully working with jealousy. So the Jealousy Roadmap is in that bundle you'll find at Jealousy Roadmap. And check out my podcast, Playing With Fire. If you want to know more and you want to just get be like a fly on the wall in a non-monogamous relationship, it's my anchor partner, Ken, and I talking about all things love and relationship and sex. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think you're offering great resources and just the conversation feels so light and bright and hopeful and optimistic. So I, I hope everybody has benefited from listening to this, regardless of whatever relationship structure you're in or want to be in. So I think that these are great principles. And just for those of you who are listening to and are interested in my stuff, I'm starting my next ethical non-monogamy group support group in like a few weeks. So make sure you hit my website, natashahelfer.com if you're, if you're interested in that, but otherwise than that, thank you all for listening. And I, it was just a pleasure meeting you, Jolie. So nice. I hope that we run into each other at the next ASAC conference or something. I like hope that. so. Yes. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Natasha Helfer podcast. To help keep this podcast going, please consider donating at natashahelfer.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional Facebook page at Natasha Helfer, LCMFT, CST-S. You can find all her cool resources at NatashaHelfer.com. The intro and outro music for these episodes are by Otter Creek. There is a place where time slows to nature's pace, and there is Find yourself in her embrace Some places should be left alone So we can always go To the homeland of the heart Earth's mysteries Some places should be left alone So we can always go To the homeland of the heart To the homeland of the heart
deep in our cities. We sleep without her stars, yet still her presence sustains us from afar. Some places should be left alone. To the homeland of the heart, to the homeland of the Please consider donating at natashahover.com and share this episode. To watch the video of this podcast, you can subscribe to Natasha's channel on YouTube and follow her professional Facebook page at Natasha Hover, LCMFT, CST-S. You can find all her cool resources at natashahover.com. The intro and outro 